Morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see all of you. We're going to have a great time. Do you believe that? A really, really great time with, with God and uh, with each other. We're now on the third of our series, and uh, and we're talking about the wonderful, incomparable, and indescribable grace. Oh my God! You've ever been to a marathon? You ran a marathon before in your life? How, uh, how long is the marathon? 42 kilometers, that's 26.2 miles. Uh, how about 10 kilometers? If I try to run a marathon, I don't think I can finish running. I can finish maybe part of it walking. Uh, I, maybe I would need at least six months or one year of, of training. When you go uh, to the Olympics, you need skill. Not only skill, you need speed. And, uh, and not only speed and skill, you also have to have endurance. If you don't make it to the end of the race, you're not going to win any medal. Get your outline. If you don't have one, raise your hand. And uh, someone will help you with one. Keep your hands raised. If you need an outline, and our first verse is found in. Let me see if my uh, thing works. It's not going to work because my. Uh, There's a missing sound. That's good. Thank you. Let's read it together. God who began the good work within you will uh, will continue his work until it is finally finished. And circle the word will. Because the verse doesn't say God might finish it. And the verse doesn't say God hopes to finish it. The Bible says whatever good work He began in your life, whatever good work He began in you, He is going to complete it. God is going to finish it. So if you've decided to give your life to Jesus Christ, if you've allowed Him to be the King of your life, and you've said and you've declared Jesus, you're number one, you are the King, you are the CEO of my life, God will take care of you. God will see to it that whatever this started, He's going to uh, finish it. Uh, what is the goal of life? What do you think is the goal? Why did Jesus Christ come to planet Earth? What is the ultimate purpose of it all? Why do these people Bible studies? Why do you attend uh, meetings uh, that proclaim the good news of salvation? What's the ultimate purpose? For a lot of people, the ultimate purpose is what? Salvation, right? You get into heaven. And it's like, if you get to heaven, wow, it's, it's mission accomplished. And uh, for this past many, many months, we've talked about this. Heaven is not the goal. Heaven is not the goal. The God of heaven is, okay, is the center and, and He is our goal. If you look at this, uh, Saturday prayers and this ministry is not just about how we can get to heaven. 
Because if you're thinking, if I get to heaven, I will be the happiest person in the planet, that's one of the biggest mistakes you can ever make. Because Lucifer was already in heaven and he was not happy. So our goal is to just make it to heaven. If you're thinking, if I make it to heaven, I'll be very, very happy, that is not so. If you're not happy before getting into heaven, when you get into heaven, still you won't be happy. You were not made for a place. You were made for a person. You were made for the incomparable and infinite love and righteousness of God. And so if God is not our utmost joy before heaven, when you get into heaven, after you visited all the planets and all the stars and all the galaxies, and eternity has not begun yet, you start asking yourself, Ano bang gagawin? Because if, if you're looking forward to eternity just because of the places you will go to, and the reason is not the heart of God, we'll be in for a terrible experience. And so we're not here just to get into heaven. We don't want to just to get across the finish line. We want to experience the purpose of God in the fullest and most fulfilling way right here and right now. Right here and right now. Jesus said, I have come to, that you might have life and that you might have it how? How? More abundantly. The life more abundant does not start after Jesus comes. The life more abundant, it starts now. And we want to have that life more abundant right now. What do we have here? The joyful Christ follower Christ. The Christ follower, the true Christ follower, is the most fulfilled, the most contented, the happiest, the most joyful, the most delighted person he or she can ever be. That's what a Christ follower is. And, and, and we want that. So we want you to be the happiest, the most joyful, the most fulfilled, the most satisfied, the most empowered Christian or Christ follower you can ever be. And it doesn't happen overnight. But you, if you're in the track of making Jesus Christ your teacher and your your teacher and your instructor every day of your life, in His way, you will experience what He has promised. So uh, this is like the joy diamond. Like, like you have a baseball diamond, is that right? This is the joy diamond. And uh, you have the first base, you have the second base, you have the third base, you have the fourth base, and you have the fifth base where it's a home run. We want you not only to start, we want you not only to begin, we want you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ who is most happy in what God is most happy with. So you'll be experiencing true worship and joining God in His mission and you'll have a life together with, with uh, fellow God enjoyers, fourth base, you will, will serve God with utmost happiness according to how He has shaped you and you will continually mature in your passion for God. So long before Jesus comes, you are already this person who is most happy in Him. That's why you can't wait for Him to come. For some of us, the reason why we want the second coming, sabi natin, ang daming gera, ang daming kagutuman, ang init sa Pilipinas, sana nasa langit na tayo. Right? And what we're looking for is actually comfort and convenience. If all you're looking for is comfort and convenience and no more war and no more uh, fighting, that is not why heaven is heaven. You know why heaven is heaven? Because of Jesus. Because Jesus is 
the desire of ages because he is the king of kings, because he is the supreme treasure, because he is the pearl of great price, because he is the lily of the valley, because he is our Lord and our Savior. So there you go. Now, as I've shared with you, uh, how do you go to first base, then move to second base, to third base, to fourth base? Here's an example. Okay, I'll just flip. Click all this. There you go. There you go. You want to accomplish first base? It's so simple. Watch and enjoy this DVD, Indescribable. As I said last Saturday, if you haven't seen this, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, next. Watch and enjoy how great is our God, DVD. You'll just get floored how magnificent and powerful and beautiful and huge and intense God is. The third one. We have some articles like why the good news is so good. Uh, have you got something? Have you experienced something? It's so good. It's so nice. So great. Think about it. If, if, if we truly know what the good news is, that is going to happen. There's going to be this fire in your bones. It's like you can't sleep. Pag parang sasabihin mo, sa second coming na lang tulog, masyad ito masarap, masyad ito maganda, kailangan malaman ito ng maraming tao. But you need sleep. Okay? And you need to rest and you need to eat. So, you'll have a balanced life. But what I'm saying is, the Christian life or being a Christ follower, hindi yung, sige, is this lang. Di ba? Pagdating sa langit, sasaya din tayo. That's not the life of a Christ follower. You are the happiest person you could ever be. The most fulfilled, the most contented. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want a million dollars to not make me happier because I am already the happiest that I can be. You know your treasure. You know who God is. You know what your fulfillment is. And that's what we're talking about. Who God is. So you have... You have these uh, resources, uh, write-ups, why the good news is so good, God's unconditional part in our identity, who I am in Christ. I'm a child of God, I'm the soul of the earth, I'm the light of the world, I'm more than a conqueror, I'm the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Satan is a defeated foe, his back has been broken, his head has been crushed, I am a friend of God. You wake up in the morning and you know your identity. You just know in your heart who you are, where you're going, why you're here, and you know the mission of God, and you join Him in the most significant mission there is in the whole history of the universe. And so you want blessings because you want to bless others. You don't pray for blessings so that these blessings will become the source of your happiness. Blessings will not make you happy. God is your happiness. But you need blessings to bless others. Because orphans, they need the shelters. Okay? The hungry, they need food. The lost, they need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus. And you know why you want the blessings of God. So you have, you also have this Discover Grace lessons. Okay? Discover Grace 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Discovering God's plan for my life. Discovering my identity. Discovering God's Salvation, discovering God's pardon, discovering God's freedom, discovering God's assurance, and discovering God's power in my life. You've got that in written, in, in audio, you've got a God-centered gospel, seven lessons, and you've got this first base grace seminar, four hours. You complete this first base, okay? Then you go second base, third base, fourth base, fifth base, home run. Okay? What's gonna happen when you reach like third base, fourth base? It's like uh, you know the difference between MMDA and a SWAT, SWAT team, right? MMDA is called the police patola sometimes. Like just in charge of the traffic. It's, it's a good, decent work. But our mission is to tackle the kingdom of darkness. Alright? It's not simply how to make life work. That is not our mission. How to have the best marriage. That's not the ultimate purpose of life. We have joined God in His mission. And His mission is the most important of all. What is it? And what is the training and the equipping that you need? Is the purpose of why we are needed together. And why we have this track. And why we have this diamond. And why we have these resources. 
So uh, stay with, with, with this with this wonderful process and it's going to be one of the best investments of your life. One of the best investments of your energy and of your commitment. Why? Because you can be the person God has meant for you to be. By the way, uh, next Saturday, we'll have two services. We have one service that starts at 11. Next Saturday, we have one that starts at 11 and one that starts at 3.30. Okay? Exactly the same sort of message. Alright? We'll have a different band, but it's exactly the same. So if you have friends who are more available in the afternoon, bring them in the afternoon. If you have friends who are more available in the morning, bring them in the morning. Okay? The good news is so good. We want to provide all the opportunities for people to know who Jesus, who God, who God is. We have a survey form, I hope. You're going to answer them so that we can text you and, uh, and, uh, and give you the, the information. So, that's what we're up to. Okay? Now, 1 Peter 5.11. What does it say? My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that the grace of God is with you no matter what happens. No matter what happens, whatever challenge we face, whatever trial is going to be on our way. God's sustaining grace is going to be with us. You can be assured with that. You can be certain with that. There is nothing that can happen in your life that can ever take you away or snatch you away from the hands of God. Sustaining grace, if you're wondering what that is, it is the power of God that keeps you on going whenever you feel like giving up. The sustaining grace of God is that which keeps you in the race. Until you become the person God has meant for you to be and God getting all the glory. Do you ever need sustaining grace? Have you ever have you had times in your life you felt like giving up? Like when you say when it rains pours and you're at the end of your rope and you like to surrender and you want to give up, you have this assurance it's going to be there. But there are things in life that can cause us to stumble and would really want us to give up. Okay? Here's number one. I can count on God's sustaining grace to help me keep on standing first. When? When I'm te tempted. You ever get tempted? Somebody says, Alam mo, hindi na ako natutokso. You want that? Yung hindi ka na natutokso. Pag hindi ka na natutokso, kapit na kayo ni Satan. Hindi <laughs> ko na yung tutokso eh. Kasama na kami niyan eh. Alright? So it's good news when you're being tempted. That means Satan still hates you. And God wants to destroy you. Uh, Satan wants to destroy you. Okay? And Satan wants to, to, uh, Satan wants to, uh, to kill your hope and steal from you your joy. So, you still get tempted? Every day, okay. Every day we get tempted. Now you can out, you can count on the sustaining grace of God to keep you standing, to keep you in the race, to keep you strong. All right. When you are tempted, First Peter chapter five and verse eight. Watch out for attacks from the devil, your great enemy. He crawls around like a roaring lion looking for some victim to devour. So, uh, Satan doesn't want to eat your lunch. He wants you for lunch. You have an enemy. When you signed up, okay, when you committed your life to Jesus, you signed up for a battle. You signed up for war. You made a declaration, Satan is my enemy. And Satan is out here, out there, wherever you are, to destroy you. The thief cometh not before to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You're not Satan's property. 
You don't belong to Him. He's taking His hand off you because of Jesus. You're now in the hands of God. But there's a battle every single day of your life, every hour of your life, every moment of your life. You're going to, you're going to face many, many choices. Am I going to treasure God above all? Will I have God at the very center? Will I make Jesus as the one who is supreme in in mind. We're all tempted. Everybody is tempted. Um, when I was small, I was thinking, maybe when I grow older, I won't be as tempted as when I, I was young. I had those thoughts. Like growing up as a teenager, as you know, in, in, in Angela City, uh, temptations, they are down. And temptations, left and right, front and back, wherever it's called it. And I was thinking maybe when I go to college, I won't have these temptations anymore. Or maybe when I'm working as a pastor, maybe I won't have these temptations anymore. And uh, there's more temptations now, I think, than, than, when I, than when I was younger. You will never outgrow temptation. The Bible says even Jesus was tempted. Okay? Even Jesus was tempted. He was tempted in all points like we are. Now, here's some good news. If Jesus was tempted, and if Jesus never sinned, that means it's not a sin to be tempted. Is that good news? Okay? Jesus was tempted, Jesus never sinned. That means being tempted is not a sin. Some of us, we don't know what temptation is. We think it's already a sin. And so we get this spirit so bad. And you say, I'm oh, What kind of a person am I? You cannot stop a bird from flying over your head. But once it starts building a nest on top of your head, there's something you can do. Is that right? So you can't, you, can't stop Satan. you can't stop Satan from tempting you. But when he starts to make his ideas, when, when he starts to make your mind the dwelling place of your ideas, there's definitely something you can do about, about it. Uh, here's one strategy of Satan. I want you to know this. It's not in the... In your outline, but it's found in John chapter 13 and verse 2. And Judas, after supper has ended, Satan put in his mind to betray Jesus. Okay? And supper having ended, Satan placed in the mind of Judas to betray Jesus Christ. What does that tell you? Not all thoughts, not all thoughts come from you. Because Satan has the ability to inject thoughts. And sometimes you say, Because you don't know the strategy of Satan, you own what was like a a, uh, as fast as a lightning and, and, and a thought went inside and readily you blame yourself. But and, and you don't even think that it's the work of the enemy. Satan can do that. He can put ideas in your mind, he can put thoughts in your mind, and he wants you to think that you were the one who thought those thoughts and now you're defense. You are now stuck in your guilt. For example, uh, sexual temptation. They feel very real. Uh, are we sexual beings? We are. God made us as sexual beings. Whether you're a man or a woman, God gave, gave us sexual feelings. Now, sexual feelings, they're not wrong. They're not bad. They're not even sin. Okay? Unless... 
you use them in a wrong way or apply them to a wrong person. Got that? Okay? Many people misunderstand and confuse attraction with lust. They're not the same thing. Sometimes we even confuse arousal with lust. They're different things. They're not the same thing. So if a man is sitting outside and a good looking woman walks by and thinks, wow, that's a good looking woman. Is that sin? That's not lust. That is attraction. Okay? What you're actually saying, wow, look at what God made. Alright? And the glory goes to God. It's not love, love. So if you're a man, be grateful you have that feeling. Be grateful you have that feeling. If you don't have that feeling, let's talk after the service. Alright? Something's wrong. <laughs> And if you're a woman and you see a good looking hunk of a man and you're attracted to him and maybe even around, like, look at that good looking man. That certainly is not sin. Okay? It is not sin. What is lust? Lust is not arousal. Lust is not attraction. Lust is when you take a thought and begin to dwell on it in your mind and you begin to mentally have an affair with that person. Alright? You have committed adultery in your mind. So when you begin to fantasize with that person and to imagine what would it be to be with that person? That is temptation turned into sin. Okay? That is temptation turned into sin. You've crossed the line, but it is not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to temptation. So giving in to temptation, that's sin. But to be tempted, it is not sin. Uh, Billy Graham, when he was interviewed by Larry King, said, uh, you've been like, you're, at that time, you, you're 80 years old and you've been in the public limelight, limelight and there was never a scandal in your life. Uh, how did you manage? And, and Billy Graham just gave this verse. Let's read it. The temptations uh, that we have are the same ones that all people have, but you can trust God. He will not let you be tempted more than you can stand. When you are tempted, God will also give you a way to escape that you will be able to stand. That's God sustaining grace. So any temptation that comes to your life, you have this assurance. You can be assured that through the power of God, through this promise, you will be able, God will be able to hold you up. So we don't have unique situations and, uh, and we say, I can bend the rules because uh, this is a special. No. All temptations, they happen to us and whatever the temptation is, God will make us king for us. Here's, here's the second one. The sustaining, of grace, the, the sustaining grace of God, you can count on it to keep you standing okay, when you're what? When you are, you ever get tired? So it's tired today. We get tired. Sometimes you're not tempted. Sometimes you're just tired. Life is often exhausting. It requires a lot of strength. It requires a lot of energy to live life. Especially when you're trying to make God the very center and most supreme in your life. There are a lot of people in life uh, that don't try to do the right thing. They just uh, coast through life. 
But when you're doing this coasting through life, you're not going up, you're going down. And it's not a good thing. But when you're doing what God wants you to do in this fallen world, it requires effort, it requires strength, it requires energy. And sometimes we think the more we try to do what's right, the more, the more energy it's going to require. I want to share this verse with you, it's in your outline. It is God who gives us the ability to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us and He has identified us as His own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Stand firm, Holy Spirit, in our hearts. Very related. You can stand, stand firm because of the fact of God's work placing His Holy Spirit upon your heart. But I want to explain this a little bit. The reason why many of us are tired all the time is this. We try to live the Christian life. You try to live the Christian life, you're going to get very tired. You try to keep the Ten Commandments, you are going to get very tired. You try to live like Jesus, you're going to be, or you're going to get very, very tired. People say, it's very hard to be a Christian today. You've heard that? It's very hard. Do you agree with that? It's very hard to be a Christian today. The Bible does not agree. It's not hard to live the Christian life. It's impossible to live the Christian life. And that's the reason why you're tired. You're trying to live like Jesus. You're trying to keep the commandments of God. And you are trying to be a person of integrity. You are trying to live the Christian life. And what happens is, because it's not happening, okay, you get frustrated and you get very tired. I was reading a book. A very, very old book. And in one of the chapters it read, None can imitate Christ. And immediately, I felt inside, Whoa, what's happening? Because it says, None can imitate Christ. And it goes on, Stop struggling. Stop trying hard. Stop sweating. Stop trying to imitate Jesus Christ. And I said, Whoa, what's happening? But I kept on reading. Rather, it said, Stop imitating Jesus Christ. Instead, let Him live His life in you. Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, it is Christ who lives in me. Let Jesus be Jesus through you. Stop trying and trying and just start trusting and trust it. This is what you really mean by let go and let God. Now can imitate Christ. If you say you don't agree, okay, let's follow that thought. If you can imitate Christ, that means you have imitated His righteousness. You have copied His righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is not meant to be common. It's meant to be received. The righteousness of Jesus is not meant to be imitated. It's meant to be embraced. Jesus is to be your righteousness. You don't copy His righteousness, so He's righteous and you are righteous. If He is righteous and you are righteous, you don't need Him. Because you're now righteous. So you don't imitate the righteousness of Jesus. You accept the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why the name of Jesus is what? The Lord our righteousness. That's what we mean by the reason you're tired, you're tired is because you're trying to imitate Jesus. Don't imitate Jesus. Let Him live His life through you. Let Him live His life 
in. Be a vessel, be a, uh, be a channel of this righteousness of Jesus Christ. And, and when we understand that, we will experience, we will experience the sustaining grace of God. Here is a verse, it's found in Philippians 2.13. What does it say? For God is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve His purpose. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So even the willingness, okay, it's provided by God. Who made the Son? Who made the Son? God. Okay? You know how powerful the Son is? Just one second. Okay? Now, the Son produces more power in one single second than all the human race has used throughout all history. All the electric power, all the horse power, okay? all the mechanical power the human race has used on planet Earth. The sun has produced more power in one single second. Remember the figure 92 billion? 92 billion. What's about 92 billion? 92 billion. According to NASA, okay, the power of the sun is equivalent to the explosion of 92 billion nuclear bombs all exploding at the same time per second and every second thereafter. Imagine that. Every second, 92 billion nuclear bombs exploding at the same time. And then the next second, and then the next second, and then the next second, and then the next second. That's why we have this energy and heat and power that comes from the sun. You can fit a million earths inside of the sun. God made the sun. So are you in need of power? God has unlimited power. But did you know Amos and Joyce can fit billions of suns? Whoa, and then, so if you are in need of power, there is unlimited power available you can experience so that you can enjoy God for the treasure that He is, so that you can have the more abundant life right here and right now, whatever the situation, every moment and every second of your life, whatever the trial you're facing, whatever the challenges you have in your family and in your life. God's saying, I will energize. The power of the sun, that's nothing compared to my power. 92 billion nuclear bombs all exploding at the same time. That's not even the beginning of the power of God. And that power that made the heavens and the earth is the same power that will keep you standing when you're tired. When you want to give up. There's another way. Okay? The sustaining power of God keeps you standing when? When you are when you are in trouble. You've ever been in trouble? Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. If you're not yet in trouble, just wait. <laughs> it's guaranteed. Okay? It's guaranteed. In this world, you will have tribulation. You will have problems. You expect it. Don't be surprised. Like, whoa, wait. It's normal. Okay? If you're in a battlefield, there's going to be bombs, there's going to be explosions, there's going to be bullet wounds, there's going to be conflict. We are in a fallen world. It is dark. And there is sin. So expect trouble. Expect tribulation. Expect trials. You're going to have difficulties. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to have situations you cannot handle. And God is saying, my grace will sustain you. It's not your skill, it's not your talent, it's not your power. My grace will sustain you. My grace will sustain you. So don't worry 
Because I am with you. Don't be afraid because I am your God. I will walk, make you strong. I will help you. I will support you with my right hand. Now that saves you. In Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. This is God's sustaining but when you're in a situation you can fix, you're in a situation you cannot solve, what do you actually do? Yes, the power of God is unlimited. Yes, the resurrection power of Jesus is inside of us. But how do you actually experience it? Uh, there was a man who was living under the bridge, can't find any shelter. He's so poor, when he's hungry, where does he go? He'd go to the garbage cans and just pick his food from there. And uh, look at his uh, clothes. Just one, uh, just, it's what he's got. So that's how poor he was. But he's got his friend who was looking for him for a very, very long time. Both tied, billionaire, can't find his friend. So the friend went to this bank account and opened an account in the name of his friend. I'm opening this bank account. And he put millions of dollars. Okay? And the bank agreed. So, uh, according to the papers, the owner of, of the funds is his friend of his who's missing. They can't find him because he sits from one bridge to another bridge. Okay? Can't be located. Now, as far as the documents and the banks are concerned, is this guy a rich man? Is he a rich man? A really rich man, right? But in the evening, where is he going to sleep? Under the bridge. What kind of food is he going to eat? Trash, right? What kind of clothes is he going to wear? Same clothes he's been wearing. But is he a rich man? A very rich man. But he's living like a pauper. And many times that, our, that, that is our situation. Because God said, I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I have given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. You are complete and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So we have everything. All the resources of heaven have been made available to back us up in this life. To have the more abundant life. But we live our lives like we don't have anything. Spiritually, we're like Satan's soccer balls, right? Anytime he wants to kick us, he just kicks us. Anytime he wants to make you cry, he just makes you cry. Anytime he wants to play, anytime he wants to, to toy you around, toy around with you, he just does it. And you feel like, oh, Satan is here again. What am I going to do? But you're more than a conqueror. You're the soul of the earth. You're the life of the world. Satan is a defeated foe. Why is this? Happy. Not because there is a lack in so far as the power of God is concerned, because it has it has already been given. So it's one thing to have the power of God, it's another thing to experience the power of God. You have the power of God under your name. But it doesn't mean you know it, it doesn't mean you have discovered it, and it doesn't mean you know how to use it. You can have a MacBook. Happened with me. My sister bought me a computer, but I've used Windows all my life. So how do you turn this on? I don't even know. So it can do powerful things, but I can't benefit from it. Not because I don't have it, but because I I don't have the knowledge. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. My people are destroyed. Because of lack of knowledge. So we fall, not because there's no power available. We fall, not because the presence of God is not with us. We have everything in the name of Jesus Christ. What we need is, how do you use this sword of the Spirit? How do you use this helmet of salvation? How do you use this breastplate of light righteousness? How do you use this... this this uh, belt of truth, this gospel, of the shoes of the gospel. How do you use it? You have the armor of God, but are you using it 
and do you know how to use it? We have everything that we need. So how do you actually experience the power of God? Don't pray so that God will give you more power. No. You already have all the power you need. What we need is the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we understand more oh, all the power I need. It's already here. You start asking at God, how do I use it? Lord, I need understanding to realize all the power and all the strength I need is already given. What we need is for our eyes to be open. How to experience the power of God? Just straightforward. Number one, you completely what? Completely surrender. How do you completely surrender? Look at this verse, James 4, 6 to 8. God gives grace to the humble. Who's the humble person? Do you know who the humble person is? The humble person is the one who says, God, I can do it. That's the humble person. Where can you find in the Bible, God helps those who help themselves? Old Testament, New Testament. Huh? Old or new, God helps those who help themselves. It's not in the Bible. Okay? But that's how we live. God does it all. But you surrender all. Okay? God does it all, but you surrender. There's a difference between the fight of sin and the fight of faith. You don't fight sin. Okay? God fights sin. If you fight sin, if you fight the devil, you're like doing shadow boxing. Can you win in shadow boxing? No. Okay? The devil is a spirit. You need another spirit to take care of him. The Holy Spirit. Okay? But what you will fight is the fight of faith. That's why Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. What is the fight of faith? This is keeping God as the very center of your life. This is making Jesus the supreme treasure of your life. This is making God your utmost passion, your greatest joy, your, your greatest value in your life. That's the fight of faith. Jesus is my treasure. The Lord is my shepherd. So you completely surrender. And to surrender is to admit, okay? Uh, you watch UFC? You've seen UFC? What's UFC? Ultimate Fighting Champion? Fighting Champion? Something, okay? And then we have this term when they start hitting the. What's that? Tap? Tap out? What do we mean when tap out? Why tap out? Huh? Why do one of the wrestlers. Uh, what's the reason? They've given up the idea that they're going to win. So come up. This is surrender. This is number one. This is giving yourself to God. This is complete surrender. God, I cannot make myself holy. God, I cannot change my life. God, I don't know what the future is. God, there's nothing I can do. God, the best I can manufacture is just filthy rags. God, I give up. You surrender the idea there's something you can do apart from God. So you give up. Complete surrender. It's not God does part of it and you do part of it. You've gone through heart surgery. Okay? The surgeon does it all. But you surrender at the operating at the operating table. <coughs> uh, just one more thing at, at this part. I want to share a minute about the nature of this chapter. Just write Joshua 24 and verse 15. Joshua 24 verse 15. You know what the Bible says? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Okay? That's the fight of faith. Many times it is the fight we're fighting. Choose you this day what you will do. Will I do this? Will I do that? Will I not do this? Will I not do that? 
And we think that's the battle. No. What you do and what you don't do is already the result you have, is already the result of the power you have chosen in the first place. You don't choose what to do primarily. You choose the power that will take charge of your life. Okay? Choose you this day whom you will serve. So you are the servant. Whomever you chose is the master, and the master has power over his servant. So you choose whom you will serve. And then whatever you do is already the result of the power you chose in the first place. But sometimes, what we do is, will I do this? Will I do that? Not realizing if you neglected the fight of faith, you will naturally do the results you will naturally do those things. You will naturally do those things as a result of the power that is already in control of your life. So when you wake up in the morning, you make your de decision. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Fill your mind with the word of God, fill your mind with the word of God. What did David say? Psalm 125, that really I am completely discouraged. I am completely discouraged. Revive me by watching TV. Oh. Does it say? Remind me by going to Facebook. We have many activities, they're not bad, but they won't revive you. Okay? What will revive you? What can do it is only the Word of God. You know Star Wars? Many, 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 many years ago, there was this great theologian in that movie. Uh, you know Obi-Wan Kenobi? Uh, he says to young uh, Luke Skywalker, yes. Luke Skywalker was going through a crisis. And this is what he said. The answers are within you. Look. Look inside yourself. And that's what you've been hearing for the longest time. Look within yourself. No, you look to the Word of God. You look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Don't look to other people, don't look to psychics, don't look to others, you look to God. There's this business section of one newspaper. Uh, you know the psychic hotlines? Psychic hotlines, like you dial and uh, they'll tell you what's going to happen. So, psychic hot hotline. Uh, the Psychic Friends Network, they file for bankruptcy. Imagine, psychic hotline business. They filed for bankruptcy. Their lawyer said they made some bad decisions due to some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, they should have seen it coming, right? It's a psychic hotline. Uh, but we do that. We go to the horoscope. We go to uh, the crystal ball, right? And we neglect the word of God. It is true, the word of God alone. I'll say something more about that in a little bit. Accept support from God, from God's people. We're a family here at Saturday Praise. We, we just enjoy you coming. We want to know you more. We want to be friends. Uh, don't leave right away. We have a great fellowship lunch. I don't just preach. I also cook chili. Here's <laughs> chili again. <laughs> and we have small groups actually. You can get into one. It's essential for your physical, spiritual, and mental health. If you're already in one, hallelujah. You need a support group. 
God never meant for you to go through life on your own. You're not a lone ranger. Actually, even the lone ranger had a partner. You're not going to make it on your own. You need to accept support from the people of God. So we just want to keep growing as a family of God in this place so that whatever our challenges are, we can share our burdens together and carry them together. Here's the last one. By helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law, the law of the law of Jesus. And the last one on your outline, you hold on to God's promises. Here's one example of God's promise. Isaiah 40, 29, 31. Shall we read it? He gives strength to whom? To the weary and increases the power. Uh, that's not the right spelling. The power of the weak, even youths grow tired. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. My dear brother, my dear sister, you keep your hope in the Lord. And even more than that, let us keep focus. On Jesus Christ, here and now and every day of, of our lives. Second Corinthians 4.18 So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now, rather we look forward to what we have not yet seen. For the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come with us forever. Let me just share this one last point with you. Jesus said when he was at Gethsemane, pray. Watch and pray that what? That you enter not into temptation. So how do you deal with temptation? By watching and praying. Okay? But there's a sequence. Notice the sequence. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. What's the sequence? Watch and pray now. So that when temptation comes later, you will not fall into it. What we do is, we wait for the temptation and then we pray. Don't fix your roof when the storm comes. Before the storm comes, fix the roof. Okay? Put gasoline in your car before the journey. Not in the midst of the freeway. Watch and pray now so that when temptation comes later, you will not fall into it. This is what you mean by holding on to the promises of God. Even now, enjoy the promises of God. Even now, enjoy the presence of God. Even now, meditate on the Word of God. Even now, memorize the Word of God. Fill up the tank right now so that tomorrow, the next day, the next week, whatever happens, because every day you're meditating on the Word of God, you're watching in prayer, you will always be ready. So you're in the box. What do you do? Watch and pray. You're in the line. Wait to deposit your money. What do you do? Watch and pray. Okay? Whatever you're doing, watch and pray. Be away. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, which are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved. 
In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself. That in the, that in the fullness of the times He might gather together all things in one, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Him. And I was starting to memorize some of the Word of God. And I have this. I still have, I still have my, see, my notes. I, I printed Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm on this long line in the grocery and I just like, oh, and this was three years ago. Three years ago. And uh, it was one of the most wonderful things God used in my life. Just store your mind with the word of God. Store your mind with the word of God. That's how you watch and pray. And then, whether you get tempted, whether you're tired, or whether you're in trouble, God will hold you up. You know why? When God holds you up, He doesn't do it by magic. Like, like you're falling down. And God will say, like He gets a magic wand. And He says, and you start just not falling. No. Whatever God does, He does it through His Word. So if God will do something, He will do it through His Word. When He created the heavens and the earth, what did He use? The Word of God. When He cast out demons, what did He use? The Word of God. Whatever God does, He uses the Word. So if God will make you strong, He will use His Word. That's why David said, Your Word have I hid in my heart, that I may not sin against. Will you treasure God to me? Will you treasure His presence? It's the best thing we can do with our lives. I'd like to call on the praise team at this time. We have this song entitled 